Hey, the YouTube is a boy Lipid out here with another reaction video. Today we got the full MX370 story so far by Mentor Pilot. Let's get right into it, shall we? Hit it. Now is the time to understand more so that we feel, we feel less. Damn. Which is crazy because of how she died. It, if you know, you know, but radiation is a scary thing. But we're talking about MH370 right now, so fair enough. This story has been massive, and I didn't realize the plane was lost 10 years ago. How can a Boeing 777, one of the biggest and most modern aircraft in the world, just vanish without a trace? It can't. Oh, that is... Everything lost leaves a trace. I know a little bit about the pieces about it. Airlines but... flight with 239 people on board. MH370. Flight 370. Flight MH370. There are mysteries in the world, and then there is a story of MH370. This is a story so full of questions and theories that it's almost impossible to tell it without resorting to pure speculation. This is the reason I have refrained from covering it up until now, but since at the time of this video's release, it's gone 10 yeah, years since yeah. 239 people disappeared without a trace, I've decided to make an exception. This story is created with one goal and one goal only, and that is to persuade the authorities to restart the search for the missing Boeing 777. And with that, hopefully also provide some closure to the families, some of which I've been in contact with before making this video. I will today share with you new potential evidence based partially on a technology that has been enhanced and refined over the last few years to the point where it now possibly can provide new clues to where this aircraft finally ended up. This is the story of Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 as far as we know it. Okay. Because it's scary how I could remember that was, that was yesterday when this investigation On the started, 7th of yeah. March 2014, a crew from Malaysian Airlines right? checked in for a night Is duty which was to take them from Kuala Lumpur International Airport in Malaysia up to Beijing, Beijing right, International yeah. in China. Mm -hmm. Except for the late start time, it was supposed to be a quite nice duty with a calculated flight time of only 5 hours and 34 minutes, meaning that they would eventually be finished in Beijing around mid-morning the following day. The captain of the flight arrived first so and signed flight, in maybe. at the Malaysian Airlines crew room at local time 22.50. He was then followed by his colleague, the first officer, around 25 minutes later. This was planned as a training flight for the first officer, since he was completing a transition type course over from the Airbus A330 to the Boeing 777, which they would be flying on this flight. The training had gone really well up until this point, and if everything went fine on this flight, he would be recommended for final line check by the captain for the following duty. Having said that, this was the first time that these two pilots were planned to fly together, which might explain why the captain had turned up a little bit earlier. You see, it's pretty common for us instructors to do so if we need to review someone's training file, for example, before the flight to right. check out okay. if there's any areas that might require special attention. In any case, once the first officer had also signed in, the two pilots proceeded by going through the pre-flight briefing, which from what they could see looked pretty straightforward. The weather in Kuala Lumpur was generally nice and dominated by a subtropical high pressure centered over Thailand, and the weather at their destination Beijing also looked quite good from what they could see. The only potential issue was that about two-thirds down the route they would be passing through a pretty strong jet stream with high winds, which could cause a bit of turbulence, but apart from that it was looking pretty straightforward. With that in mind, and no notams affecting the flight notice, either, notice the pilots the then radio. turned their attention okay. to the flight plan. There were two alternates listed for Beijing, and taking into consideration both of these, hmm. the pilots decided on a final fuel of 49,100 kilos, which was in line with the expected amount for this flight, neither substantially more nor less than required. This fuel would give the aircraft an approximate endurance of 7 hours and 31 minutes, around 2 hours longer than the anticipated flight time, and that will of course become very important in this story. 
So who were Sorry, supposed I, to become minutes know. around two hours longer than the anticipated flight time, and that will of course become very important in this story. Hmm. So who were the pilots that were going to be in charge of this flight then? Well, the captain was a 53-year-old with a 33-year great track record in Malaysia Airlines. He was married with three children and on his spare time he was involved in the local opposition party, helped deliver groceries to elderly and tinker with some home electronics. He had also started a YouTube channel, which by the way is still there, where he showed how to mend certain home appliances and also, crucially, where he showed off his home simulator, which he had built to be able to practice his trade at home. You know, I, I, I'm going to have to mention it right here. Shout out to my G for starting a YouTube channel. And bro, I, I imagine like, you know, in a different parallel universe, if he was alive and he actually committed to just flying and, you know, if things went well, he might have had a successful YouTube career as well, man. Yeah. Uh... This simulator would later be investigated thoroughly. Because the whole the insane thing about a you know, flight simulator for me is the fact that you even want to build a simulator, have the parts, have three displays and monitors. That's commitment to you know building it. And uh, that commitment speaks to the fact that most people don't do that. Most people aren't really committed to even, you know... Yeah, getting out of their way to build something like that. They might well buy it ready-made, but the fact that you're willing to repair stuff, you know, have the inquisitive mind to, you know, uh, ask, you know, around certain questions as to why things break, that speaks to a very, you know, I won't, I won't just say an intelligent person, but it speaks to someone who, who likes to self-assess, I'd like to imagine, and is able to, like, really figure out if he wants something done, he'll be the best person to get it done as well. So, who knows? It had been erased Just from what I understand so far. before the flight, but the investigator still found some manually entered waypoints of interest in a backup memory, but without it proving to be anything conclusive. Okay. In any case, the captain had heard, stable heard finances, that, yeah. no known illnesses, and was regarded as a solid, reliable member of his That's community. That's what's terrifying. In terms of his aviation career, it had started when he was accepted into a sponsored program for Malaysian Airlines already back in 1981. Well. He completed his licenses and then started flying for them back in 1983. He then worked his way up the ranks, starting on the Fokker F-27 and then the 737-200, Airbus A300 and finally he got his first command on the Fokker 50. This was then followed by command on the 737-400 and the Airbus A330 until actually on my birthday, the 22nd of September 1998, he received his command wait on the Boeing Wait, wait what? I'm sorry, the most surprising fact of all, everything that you just said is the fact your birthday is in what? The 22nd of September 1998. You're younger than me? <laughs> Mentor pilot, okay, wow, I did not know that, okay. He received his command wow. on the Boeing 777, which he then continued to operate until the day of this flight. What's also fascinating is just the wide variety of planes that my man's flown. Like, this is... I can only imagine just how difficult it would be to just keep switching from plane to plane. But, yeah, my man was... Had to be really good at his job to be able to do all of this, so fair enough, fair enough. His Talented individual. good track record and seniority eventually gave him the opportunity to also become a type rating instructor, as oh. well as an examiner on this type. And it was in this capacity that he was going to operate Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 on this evening. He had a total experience of just over 18,400 hours, and 8,659 of those had been flown on the Boeing 777. The first officer was 27 years old and single. He had also been accepted into the airline as a cadet pilot, started in 2008, and he'd been flying initially on the Boeing 737-400. He had then changed over to the Airbus A330 fleet in 2012, and then on to the Boeing 777 in November 2013, mm. just a few months before this flight. And this was obviously why he was still in training. He had a total experience of just over 2,800 hours and very little, 40 only hours 39 or less on hours on okay. type. There is not much more mentioned about the first officer in the final report, except that he was known as a nice person with stable economy and no recent major changes in his life. Okay. Now, given the vast difference in experience, seniority and the fact that this was a training flight, it can be easily assumed that the power gradient in the cockpit would have been quite steep, but nothing indicated any personal issues hmm. between these two colleagues. Both of them had also received more than the required rest before the flight and their licenses and medicals were all up to date. Okay. When the pilots had completed their pre-flight preparation and training briefing, they walked over to their 10 cabin crew members that they were scheduled to operate together with. 
This was a vastly experienced mm. crew with the most junior attendant having flown for 13, 13 years, yeah. years and the most senior over 35 years. Yeah. So the briefing would have been pretty quick and efficient. After they were finished, they all walked together out to the aircraft that was being prepared for them by the ground crew outside. Uh, I have to pause here, but I'm actually I'm really happy that he's, he's explaining this thoroughly, like item by item by item. Like he's going the whole way here. So shout out, mentor. This is this is good because this is like the entire chain of events that happens. Because once this plane gets in the air, it was a majestic Boeing triple seven two hundred extended range, right? equipped with two Rolls Royce Trent eight nine two Bravo turbofan engines, and it was in perfect working condition mm. according to the tech log. The only point of interest was that the flight crew oxygen cylinder had been topped up just prior to the flight, but this was a routine maintenance mm. thing. Now, there are numerous systems aboard this aircraft that will become important for this story. Okay. And in order to explain it, I will have to become quite technical in some places. But also, that's kind of what we do here on the channel. Okay. Anyway, the two pilots had decided that the first officer was going to be pilot flying for this yeah. flight, meaning that he immediately started completing the pre-flight preparation as soon as he arrived to the cockpit. Okay. This included inputting flight information like the flight number and the airline info into the FMC CDU, which he did at time 23, 56 and 8 seconds. Okay. Now you might wonder how we can know that so exactly. Hmm. And this has to do with the system that will play an incredibly important role here. The Aircraft Communications Addressing and Reporting System, more commonly referred to ACARS. as ACARS. This is a digital data link system which connects data providers on the ground directly to the aircraft via either VHF or satellite communications. Hmm. It enables people on the ground to send things like updated weather, flight plans, and even make calls or send messages directly to the that aircraft and its airborne. Okay. And the part of this system which is going to be most important here is the satellite communications hmm. or SATCOM system. Hmm. The ACAR system booted up and established a link through the SATCOM at time 2354, and about 1 minute and 20 seconds later, it captured the first officer's inputs, as I just mentioned before. Huh. This showed that the system worked fine in the beginning of this flight, and it's worth noting here that the system uses two different satellite antennas, depending on if the aircraft's navigation system is working or not. Hmm. Remember that. Okay. Anyway, really as the first specific officer was working okay. away in the cockpit, he soon received an ACARS message containing something known as a NOTOC. Frequent viewers of this channel will know that this stands for Notification to Captain oh. and is normally sent out if the aircraft will be carrying dangerous goods. In this case, there were actually no dangerous goods on board, just some special hmm. load being loaded consisting of several tons of mangosteens, which apparently had a tendency to leak juice and water and therefore had to be checked closely. Really? The NOTOC message confirmed that the cargo <laughs> had been checked and that it wasn't <laughs> leaked. Just getting like a satellite communication information and says, oh, by the way, you got a batch of mangosteen. <laughs> that is... Okay, that is funny. What it didn't say was that there was also nearly two and a half tons of lithium ion batteries loaded on board. Yeah, that is not funny. But these batteries were individually packaged and stored in such a way that they were not considered dangerous goods. And they have uh, therefore been ruled out as a possible cause for what's about to happen. Yeah, after the whole DHL flight situation in Dubai, where they lost a plane because of lithium, if I'm not wrong, from lithium batteries. Yeah, the lithium battery fires on a plane are scary. How fast Eventually, the captain returned from his walk around and together with his colleague, they completed the rest of the pre-flight preparations and briefings. And at time 23.25, the first officer called up Kuala Lumpur delivery to request their departure clearance. Uh, delivery manager 370 oh. okay. The delivery controller told them that they were cleared to follow the PBOS 1 Alpha departure mm. from runway 32 right and initially climbed to 6,000 feet with transponder code 2157. Voyage 370 is set to Beijing via PBOS Alpha departure, 6,000 feet squawk 2157. This was read back by the first officer and less than two minutes later, Malaysia 370 also requested push and start, which was almost immediately approved. Okay. After the pushback, the aircraft received its taxi clearance and then started taxiing out towards runway 32 right through the dark Malaysian night. 
And for anyone watching the aircraft, everything looked completely normal. Hmm. But this was going to be the last time anyone saw this aircraft with their own that eyes. That is terrifying. So what about the passengers then? Well, there were 227 passengers on board, coming from 14 different nations. 153 were from China, making those the largest group, followed Malaysians. by 50 from Malaysia and 7 from Indonesia. Yeah, okay. Two of those passengers were later found to have been flying on stolen passports, and they were identified as Iranians, who were most likely looking for refugee status, and were not considered a threat. Refugee status in Beijing? Okay. None of the other passengers raised any kind of type a... of suspicion. And this means that in total, there were 239 passengers and crew on board yeah. when the giant Boeing 777 lined up on runway 32 right and, and started off. spooling up its right. engines. At 40 minutes and 37 seconds past midnight on the 8th of March, Kuala Lumpur Tower cleared Malaysian Airlines flight 370 for takeoff. 370, 32 right of takeoff. Nice. The first officer was at the controls at this point and had therefore handed over the radio to the captain and after the engines were stabilized, he pushed the toga buttons and the aircraft started accelerating down the runway. At 42 minutes past midnight, the SATCOM system recorded that the aircraft was airborne and it then continued to transmit the aircraft's identification codes together with all of the other normal data and this just showed that everything was completely normal at that stage. Hmm. The procedures in Kuala Lumpur was for the pilots to automatically switch over to the departure frequency after takeoff, so that's exactly what the captain now also did. Once he called up and identified himself, the departure controller told them to cancel the standard instrument departure and instead proceed direct towards a waypoint called Igari and continue the climb to flight level 180. Okay. It's pretty common that controllers give clearances like this, especially at night when there's typically less traffic and therefore easier to give these kind of directions. Okay, that's nice. The captain just read back the clearance and then selected Igari as the active waypoint in the FMC. The first officer would have then verified it, told him to execute the routing, and then selected flight level 180 in the mode control panel for the captain to verify, just like they would have done thousands of times before. Yeah. At this stage of the flight, everything was still completely normal, and when you listen to the ATC tapes, the voice level of the captain is completely relaxed and routine. Okay. The aircraft continued its climb towards Igari, and they were eventually changed over to the next frequency, Lumpur Radar on 132.6. Sure. This was going to be the controller looking after them until they reached the Gari and the FIR boundary towards Vietnam. Ah, uh, yeah, they have to switch to a couple of countries. Right there. Alright, 1326 Malaysian uh, 370. The captain read back this handover more or less exactly as he should by confirming the new frequency and giving his call sign, again sounding completely normal. When he called up the new area control, when he called up the new area controller, he was told that they could continue their climb to flight level 250, mm -hmm. which he also read back, and only three minutes later, they received further clearance to climb to the requested cruise level, right. flight level 350. Yeah, okay. As flight 370 progressed up towards the northeast, they were still fully visible on radar for all involved ATC units, and here it's probably a good time to start explaining a bit about radars in general. There are two different types of radar to keep in mind for this episode. Primary radar, which is also referred to as raw radar, and secondary radar. Under normal circumstances, commercial air traffic always uses both of them, but the secondary radar is what gives the majority of the information. It is dependent on a small radio transmitter, known as a transponder, on board the aircraft, and this transponder will be identified by a four-letter numerical code with numbers from 0 to 7. Remember, that was the code that the first officer received earlier as part of the departure clearance. Hmm. Now, there are two transponders on board the aircraft, and the active one will, when it's activated by the pilots, send air traffic control loads of information like position, altitude, speed, and even MCP selections in some cases. Okay. The transponders also communicates with other traffic and it therefore enables TCAS right? yeah. maneuvering. And it's these transponders that makes apps like Flight Radar 24 work, huh. since anyone can pick up the ADSB signals that they transmit. Okay. But the key thing to remember here is that the transponders are on board the aircraft, and without them functioning, secondary radar will not work, and neither will those websites or TCAS. Okay. 
And this brings us to the primary radar, which is an invention that has been with us for a very long time Right, it's just about bouncing the now. signals off of plane. In its right. essence, it works on a simple idea of sending out a radio pulse and then measuring any waves that might hit a target mm. and then bounce back to the receiver. Mm. The direction those returning waves are then coming from will give a bearing towards the target. Obviously, this technology has become much more refined since it was first invented, making it much more complex, but you get the general idea. This type of radar can be used to see things that are not transmitting right. any information voluntarily and is therefore often used by the military. Right. But given the nature of shortwave radio signals, this type of radar has a quite limited range and cannot accurately track altitude and speed very well, something that will become important soon. Okay. At 1 minute and 14 seconds past 1 in the morning, the captain of Malaysian Flight 370 called up the Lumper area controller to advise him that they were now level at flight level 350. This is uh, 370, level 350. Okay. Malaysian 370. This was acknowledged by the controller, but this was not a necessary call to make by the captain. It was more of a courtesy thing, but you could still hear from the sound of his voice that he was relaxed when he made this call, from the way that his intonation kind of dropped towards the okay. end. Okay. Uh, hmm. And it's from here on that I have a feeling that we can see the first indication of something being slightly out of order. Okay. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear that nothing in the final report has highlighted that whatever happened started as early as here, but I personally reacted to something that was just briefly mentioned in the report. You see, about seven minutes after the captain called in that they were level at flight of a 350, he called up again and reported the very same thing. In the report, this was highlighted as anomalous, but the experts didn't think that it was worth paying any attention. But that is interesting, because the way his voice annotation changed from the last time he did the call to right now, yeah, I can see that. Okay. Do, but I disagree. You see, we pilots tend to make these extra calls for two different reasons. The first is that we have just simply forgotten about it and therefore call again just to be on the safe side. But like I said earlier, this was not a mandatory call to mm -hmm. make. The other reason we do it is because we've been away from the frequency for a while, maybe because we have been fiddling with the radios or turned down the volume or something else, and we just want to make sure that ATC hasn't tried to call us while we were gone. Hmm. You see, if we make that call again and ATC just responds, Roger, or something similar, well then we know that they haven't been trying to call us, because if they would have, they would now repeat any other messages that they had previously oh, okay. tried to send. So it's, it's, so it's like, so with that, you know, it's like saying, hey, yeah, sure, on the phone. So like the other person knows you're still on the call. Okay, that's fine. Mind, that's understandable. There were seven minutes between the first call and the second mm -hmm. call, which means that something might have happened to take the captain away from the radio between those calls. Okay. The other thing that I reacted to was the tone of voice of the captain when he made that second call. Level okay. Again, the experts in the report said that they couldn't detect any stress in the voice from the recordings, but what I am hearing is a clear difference in pitch between the first and that the is second fair. call. That is fair. It's a fair assessment. In the first, the captain sounds relaxed with a clear dropping intonation towards the end, and in the second, he just sounds busy, like he's working on something at the same time that he's making that call. Hmm. This, the sound of workload, is something that I often hear in the simulator as well as when I'm doing training in the aircraft, and that's why I reacted to it when I heard I can, it. I can see it as well. I, I know personally, like from work as well, like if you are under a heavy workload, you will notice that pitch change in, in people, including yourself when you actually do work. And there's a lot of things on the table. So yeah, that's, that's anyway, right. As He's expected, not the controller just responded with... Malaysian 370. Now, this doesn't have to mean anything, and I don't want to speculate any further on this detail, but I thought it was worth to highlight given what's soon about to happen. What comes next? So the aircraft yeah. continued its cleared track up towards Igari, yeah, and within minutes yes. of that last call from the captain, the ACARS sent out its last complete routine message via SATCOM down to the ground station. Mm -hmm. 
After this, there would be a complete silence from the aircraft SATCOM for almost 1 hour and 17 minutes. This detail is super important because it tells us a lot about what likely happened in the cockpit, but I'll get back to that soon. Okay. At time 01, 19 and 24 seconds, the Lumper Area Controller instructed Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 to contact Hu Chi Minh Control on frequency 120.9. Malaysian 370, contact Hu Chi Minh 120.9. Uh, this happened about one minute before the aircraft flew past Igari, so they were still technically in Malaysian airspace, but yeah. would soon pass into Vietnam. Okay. And this is where the very last radio transmission occurred from flight 370, with the captain simply answering There it is, I just gone. Now, for some people that might have sounded like an ominous farewell, but what I heard was once again someone who was busy. So busy in fact, that he didn't complete the readback correctly. Oh. Like I mentioned before, all frequencies we are given must always be read back to avoid mistakes, mm. but that was not done in this call. In any case, now things started happening very yeah, quickly. That is... Five seconds after the aircraft flew past Igari, the Mode S functionality of the transponder, that was the part that gives that extra information, was suddenly switched off. Now the only way to switch off only that is to turn the transponder knob in the cockpit from TARA to the altitude off position. Okay. A technical malfunction would have removed all signals completely and immediately, mm. but in this case it took another 37 seconds for the secondary radar return to completely disappear. Mm. And as it did, the aircraft abruptly stopped following the planned route. Mm. We know this because the primary radar recorded the turn, and what it registered was that after the initial right turn towards a point called BTOD, the aircraft now started a sharp, almost 180 degree left turn instead. Hmm. Now, Boeing tried to replicate this turn in the simulator, but weren't able to match up the turn and the timings perfectly. The only simulation that got close included a manually flown turn, meaning that the autopilot must have been disconnected. Huh. And why is that, you might ask? Well, the autopilot will only allow certain bank right, angles. And this line. turn was so tight that a much steeper bank must have been used at least partially throughout the turn in order to accomplish it. Damn. The only reasonable conclusion that can be drawn from this is that someone had now started interfering with the flight's trajectory on purpose. Right. The timing and position of where all of this took place also looks far from That's random. Mistake, yeah. Igari was the point just between before the FIR countries, right? boundary between Malaysia and Vietnam, which meant that the controller from a new country would now be taking over the responsibility for the right. flight. The Malaysian controller, which formerly still had the responsibility, had handed the aircraft over and therefore probably didn't monitor it too closely. Hmm. And the new Ho Chi Minh controller would likely wait until the aircraft called him up before starting to pay much attention to ah, it, which okay. is also exactly what now happened. Hmm. Given this, it was the perfect place to initiate this maneuver, if the intention was to try to avoid detection. Which I think was the reason here. And now you might ask, why disengage the autopilot? Why not just complete the turn? Well, just to the north of Igari. Hmm. Thailand has something known as an Air Defense Identification huh. Zone, which on a high-level chart shows up as two dotted parallel purple hmm. lines. As the name suggests, the Thai military would be monitoring any traffic entering into that zone and follow it up unless it was properly identified, had a working transponder hmm. and followed a filed flight which plan. This <laughs> By carefully avoiding that zone, whoever was now in control would also avoid any direct scrutiny from the Thai military. Yeah. And given the direction the aircraft was now turning, it's likely that anyone looking at the primary radar would assume that the aircraft was just diverting, still under Malaysian control. Okay. This turn would also position the aircraft between that Thai ADI Z and Airway Mike 765, which would avoid any opposite traffic. Huh. This shows us that whoever was now in control was likely very well versed with the airspace structure. Right, so you avoid the military, like the whole radar zone over there, you ditch the country, you ditch Vietnam, and you're going parallel to a known airway so you can't avoid traffic. Yes! Whoever is flying really knows the airways, that's clear. Over this particular very area, clear. and that this was likely very carefully planned out. After the U-turn was finished, the aircraft continued in a semi-straight line down towards the southwest, and a VOR beacon known as Victor Papa Golf okay. near Penang in Malaysia. 
The track showed small deviations consistent with an aircraft being flown manually and not on autopilot. Mm -hmm. Now, since these radar echoes were only captured on raw radar, it was impossible to get any reliable speed or altitude data sure, from them. Okay. It is possible that the aircraft descended slightly during this segment, maybe to gain a higher true airspeed as it was overflying Malaysia. Mm. This theory was further corroborated by the fact that a Selco mobile mast on the island of Penang briefly detected a mobile phone signal, which was later confirmed to have come from the first officer's phone. Okay. Yeah. Those type of signals generally have a very limited vertical range, maximum around 30,000 so so you know feet, they actually were often much low lower altitude. than that. Okay. But given that atmospheric conditions have huge impact on the range, mm. it's very okay. hard to speculate here. Mm. But since turning off the mobile phone is a checklist item in most airlines, this could indicate that the first officer was trying to communicate here. But no call signals ever came through, and the signal was only detected for a very short Damn. while. But what is really intriguing during this segment of the flight is another system that we have already talked about a little bit, which is the SATCOM system. Right. You see, the SATCOM sends out regular interrogations every hour if no other information is being transmitted. And when the ground-based station tried to uplink an ACARS message at time 3 minutes past 2 in the morning, it didn't receive any acknowledgement back from the aircraft SATCOM. Hmm. So, what does that mean then? Well, if the ACAR system was just switched off or failed, the link would still take place. Hmm. It would just communicate the fact that ACARS wasn't working. And if the system was manually logged off from the cockpit, this would also be shown in that right. log. And because none of that happened, the most likely reason for this SATCOM loss was a power failure to the system itself. Oh. Now, this system can be powered from several different electrical buses and from most of the aircraft's redundant power sources. So this fact has led some incredibly experienced Boeing 777 pilots, whose excellent work I will be linking to in the description, by the way, to believe that whoever was in charge of the aircraft after that initial turn must have manually turned off all of those sources. Bro, could you imagine flying at night and not having any lights on the plane? And you're turning off everything, including critical systems like that? Okay, maybe not critical, but This still. can be done by deselecting you would think it the needs primary to be on the entire backup flight. generators from their buses using Jesus the buttons on the overhead panel. After that, the aircraft would react by trying to auto-start the APU in order to replace those systems. So the person in charge would then have to put the APU switch to on and then back off again to stop that auto-start from happening. Okay. If that would happen, that would then trigger the ram air turbine, the RAT, to be activated either manually or automatically, okay. and it would start to provide electrical power for the most critical systems like primary flight displays, navigation displays, and navigation equipment, but not the autopilot. Hmm. Hydraulic movement of the flight controls would not be a problem since both engines were still working and providing hydraulics, so maneuvering the aircraft manually would still work perfectly fine. Now, of course, removing the primary power sources in this way would cause everything else except emergency lighting to go black in the aircraft. Right. And it's likely that this would make things very difficult for both the crew and At the passengers night as well? in the back. Uh. And while we're on the subject of the passengers and crew, I want to point out here that we really have no idea about what actually happened to them. Jeez. Some theories have suggested that whoever was in charge might have depressurized the cabin in order to get everyone into their seats and keep... Ooh. Ooh, that is dark. And it would not be out of the realm of possibility. That is very much possible. And if they do that, well, you're knocked out. You don't... At those kind of altitudes, beyond 10,000 feet, my best guess is you probably have, like, what, a couple of seconds worth of, you know, airtime before you just get knocked out? And then you die? Control. This is You're possible less to do right? by just opening the outflow valves manually while Ooh. still keeping the air conditioning running. The fact that the air conditioning would kept running would provide heating and make it bearable in the cockpit as it otherwise would become freezing cold almost immediately. Right. The passenger oxygen masks would then drop in the back, but the oxygen generators in the 777 would only last for about 22 Ooh. minutes or so. But the oxygen cylinder, which is providing the cockpit crew with oxygen, would last a full 27 hours was just in refilled. case there's only oh, one person no. using it. And it had, like I mentioned before, been topped up in just the morning, that very yeah. morning. Shit. 
This means that if the cabin was kept unpressurized without descending, the passengers would become completely incapacitated once the oxygen right. generator stopped working. Right. But whoever was still in the cockpit would be able to just continue to operate fine, just, fine, just yeah. fine. The time of useful consciousness at 35,000 feet is about one I'm minute. Extending I'm surprised to... it's not a couple of seconds, but one minute is, you're not going to do anything. You... By the time you know your vision's blurring, it's too late. You don't have much time anymore. A few minutes at 30,000 feet. Yeah. And anyone subjected to those altitudes without supplemental oxygen would after that not be able to take any rational decisions and soon become unconscious. Yeah, yeah. After that, if no oxygen would be you provided, die. it would take another 20 minutes or so until death would yeah. occur. But like I said before, we don't know for a fact what happened. Fair, we, we but that's a good guess. We won't know until the aircraft is found, which is why it is so important that we continue the search. Now, flying an aircraft at these altitudes manually, whilst possibly wearing an oxygen mask and with only rudimentary would navigation available, would be quite tiring. Yeah. And that's likely why the radar images were showing these small heading variations. Anyway, at this stage, the aircraft continued to be tracked by both civilian and military raw radar as it continued its way around the south of Penang, where it started turning right through the Malacca Strait. Hmm. There were temporary lapses in the radar coverage, but all in all, it painted a fairly clear picture of an aircraft flying in a controlled way and not in any way random. Yeah. So, why wasn't the aircraft intercepted or tracked more closely? Because then? no one raised the alarm. Well, this was due to a combination of factors and misunderstandings between different air traffic control units and the operations controllers in Malaysia Airlines headquarters. Hmm. When the aircraft first disappeared from radar, it took around 20 minutes before the Ho Chi Minh controller called up the Malaysian controller to ask about where the aircraft actually was. Hmm. Now, this was significantly longer than the standard five minutes it should take before a query is sent. Even but then, like I mentioned before, this happened at an intersection between right, two so it's understandable. countries in the middle of the night. So it's likely that the controllers were just Fair. dealing with other traffic and didn't monitor their strips too closely. Okay. When the Malaysian controller, who was still technically responsible for the flight, was made aware of the missing aircraft, he eventually contacted Malaysian Airlines, who confirmed that they could see the aircraft flying up through Cambodia. What? This meant that the air traffic controllers now started contacting their colleagues along the route that the aircraft was thought to be flying to see if they could get into contact with them. And this in turn meant that none of them saw the lonely, faint radar echo that was traveling southwest instead. It was later found out that the Malaysian Airlines tracking software was basing the position of the aircraft on predictions when it didn't receive Oh, it doesn't have the data. actual data on it, and okay. That's what had caused that initial confusion. Well, isn't the way, what's the point of having a software that just tells you where the plane is supposed to be and it's predictive on its flight path, sorry, flight plan, instead of knowing exactly where the plane is? Like, what's the point? Like, huh? Now, the military did see the aircraft turning left. But it wasn't guard, in their area. Since it wasn't violating any new airspace, they, they assumed it was just a normal air turn back and didn't raise any further alarms or send anyone up to intercept. Okay. It was only later with the help yeah, of I radar. Also, I don't think they blamed it because I think the Thai radar, while yes, it did go a bit into like Vietnamese territory, it still did enter Thai airspace. So they kind of just ignored it. Malaysian, I'm not sure. The picture of MH370's true path became clearer. Mm. After the aircraft had turned right up towards the northwest, it looked like it was heading towards a waypoint called Vampi. The SATCOM system still had not logged on at this stage, so we can assume that the aircraft was still flying in a power degraded state, mm. possibly only with the ram air turbine as a power source, but even if that was the case, navigation would still not be a problem. The Victor Papa Golf VR was still well within range, meaning that the aircraft could use raw data navigation to find Vampi, and the waypoint could also be displayed on the aircraft's navigation okay. display, so whoever was flying could just point the nose towards okay. it. Vampi was soon passed, and the now more and more faint radar echo continued flying up in the general direction of airway November 571, okay. towards another waypoint called Meka. Okay. And it's soon after the aircraft passed slightly to the south of that waypoint at time 0 to 22 and 12 seconds that all conventional radar traces from this flight completely disappeared. Okay, so it's truly gone missing. Okay, okay, okay. 
Now there is a real possibility that there were military radars picking up signals from this aircraft for longer than this, but given the sensitivity around showing military capability or positions uh. of mobile radars, we haven't seen any such information come forward. So this means that from this point onwards, we're now although, going into although, the um, What would fascinate me is if they did have military tech that still was able to track the plane, would it not have been possible to be like, okay, we can't tell you exactly what our like capabilities are, but could they not like release a redacted document of some sort saying, this is where we think the plane is da went down on? Uh, or maybe like say, last tracked at this location right here, which I think, you know, some people might say, well, at least it's telling the position of how far their radar capability is, which might be a reason, so okay, but maybe anonymously? No, and with that comes speculation or hypothesis, which you all know I try to avoid yeah, on this channel. Factually, so let's instead try to stay with what we do right. know. In order to further track this aircraft, the investigators, scientific community and several commercial companies had to start using any data they had received in completely new ways. And a great example of this is the Inmarsat data. Mm. Inmarsat is, as the name suggests, a company providing satellite communication services, and it was through their satellites that the SATCOM system for the aircraft ACARS was operating. Okay. The signals these satellites were sending were never designed to track aircraft, but since they're were signals exchanged with damage 370, those signals could be reverse engineers to provide a crude singular position indicator every time that they appear. Okay. The way this was done was basically by mimicking certain parts of the GPS system. You see, each GPS satellite is basically an extremely accurate timing hmm. device, and when a device on Earth, like your phone, or in this case a Boeing 777, connects to one of them, the GPS satellite transmits a quick signal, which basically says, this is where I am, and this time. is the time right okay. now. That signal then travels at the speed of light, which still so takes a certain amount of, amount of time to arrive to right. your device. That time is measured hmm. to determine how far away from you the are satellite. from that GPS right. satellite. And with the satellite's position and your distance from it, we can determine That's that you are somewhere along the radius and of the circle. And they do it three circle. times. Then obviously your device will connect to multiple satellites, with which each then one of them drawing which its then own gives you one where all like of these circles where all meet. meet. Well, that's, your that's where you yeah. are. So in the case of the Inmarsat data, this same technique could basically also with be one used. Satellite. Each time the aircraft connected to the satellite using the SATCOM system, the time its system took to respond to the satellite signals was recorded. The same happened at regular intervals when the satellite checked that the plane was still connected, oh, and shit. each of these connections seven of them in total, are the famous handshakes that were reported about basically everywhere. Right. Every one of those handshakes could then be used to place the missing aircraft somewhere along a circle but at a specific all of them point them of time. The ocean, and that process no of defining it. a circle or arc is called burst timing offset or BTO. But this was not the only information that the Inmarsat signals could provide. Analysts could also pick up another value in the signal, something known as burst frequency offset hmm. or BFO. Okay. BFO gave information that could help the investigators determine how the aircraft was moving in relation huh. to the satellite. As its name suggests, it involved studying the actual frequencies of the signal that the satellite received and then how they differed from the expected frequencies. Oh, that is interesting. That's true. The further away you are, or maybe like in certain ways of motion, you might be able to figure out how tightly those waves are packed versus how they should actually be. So that gives you an inclination of how high or low the plane is. That's smart. Think of this like the way an ambulance right. siren seems to change its sound tone. Sound compresses as it before it comes to you and then expands as it moves past you. When it's yeah. coming towards you, the sound waves are denser, making for a higher right. frequency. And after it goes low. past you, yeah. the sound waves move further way. apart, yeah. giving the tone a lower frequency. Right. This is called the Doppler effect or the Doppler hmm. shift. And primary radars actually also use this in the same way to determine, for example, the speed of an hmm. aircraft. Now, I am, of course, oversimplifying yeah, these enough. concepts a bit sure. here. But in the case of MH370, since these signals between the aircraft and the satellite traveled mostly vertically, the burst frequency offset, or BFO, was instead used to help investigators determine whether the aircraft was climbing or descending. Right. Now, That's true, because it, it only matters if the plane is moving during the time of that transmission. So it could be saying you could be that you can determine if it's climbing or descending. You don't know exactly if it's staying still at a certain 
like I'll those of you who have been paying attention will have noticed that I have said that the SATCOM system was not working. So how could the Inmarsat analyst get any of these handshakes? Well, here's where we get to a really interesting development that happened at times 0 to 25 and 27 seconds. Then, all of a sudden, the previously non-responsive SATCOM system of MH370 suddenly came back to life and proceeded to start sending a logon request to the satellite. Huh. This would later be referred to arc, as the arc, first handshake. This happened almost exactly one hour after the aircraft had completed its turn after Igari, and the interesting bit is that the burst frequency offset value in this first handshake was deemed unreliable due to a quite large frequency error. Huh. And what's making that so interesting then? Well, it turns out that the quartz crystals used in the SATCOM radio transmitters needed to be kept at a constant temperature to avoid big frequency oscillations. Okay. This was achieved with the help of something known as an oven-controlled crystal oscillator, which was basically... Which would be powered off if there's no electricity in the plane. Oh my god, that's genius. ...temperature controller, and it needed time to warm right. up after a lengthy power interruption. So it is Holy likely shit, that's that it hadn't reached the correct temperature at this point when the first logon message was sent, hence the BFO which frequency would mean... error. And this is how we know that the aircraft was likely powered Whoa. down up until just... Holy shit, that is, some, that is some smart detective shit right there. Okay, wow. ...higher to this point. Science is That is really specific amazing. as well. Huh. Now, this first handshake also lacked a valid flight and company ID, which the aircraft previously had transmitted correctly. We cannot know this for sure, but if the aircraft's power had been manually restored at this point, well, Right. then the person in command would likely also know that the SATCOM system would soon boot up and start sending out data. So in order to stay hidden, he would have had to manually go into the multifunctional display and disable all communications through the communications <sighs> manager page before the satellite communication unit, the SDU, became fully operational. If this was done this way, this would also erase the flight and company info, which is exactly what, what the what data also the showed. Yeah. So you can see, even though no data was actually sent out, with a lot of ingenuity, the signals themselves can actually tell us a lot about what was likely on going there. on. We also know, for example, that the navigation system was working because of which antenna the SATCOM system was using when it started transmitting. Like I said, amazing. Right. So using the Inmarsat data, we know for sure that the aircraft continued to fly long enough to allow a total of seven handshakes where the first and the last were logon requests sent by the aircraft itself. Like I explained before, these logon requests were most probably caused by power interruptions, where the last one was likely caused by the fuel starvation of one yeah. or possibly both engines Jesus. after the aircraft had flown for around seven hours and 35 minutes. That last handshake came at time 0819 Absolutely. Malaysian time, which corresponds quite well with the endurance of the aircraft based on the recorded fuel. Yeah. Now, these handshakes occurred roughly every hour, since the system was sent to send out a ping every hour unless other SATCOM activities were initiated. Jeez, how long did that flight Two travel? of the handshakes were caused by ground-based yeah, satellite calls from the Malaysian like, I know that seven hours of fuel, but Jesus Christ. ...operations center who reached the cockpit but was left unanswered. Even so, they reset the hourly timing of the other handshakes, and that's the reason why all of these seven handshakes were not happening on the same hourly intervals. Okay. But of course, we now have a huge problem. Since the Inmarsat data was all coming from one satellite, the arcs created by these seven handshakes created multiple possible routes right. that the aircraft might have flown, and therefore an enormous potential search area. Right. Several hugely accomplished pilots and investigators have come up with very plausible scenarios on how the aircraft must have been flown after that last radar position to both align with all of those seven handshakes and avoid detection. Almost everyone agrees that the most likely route includes a turn from the previously northwesterly course around the area of a waypoint called Nilam onto a more southwesterly course. Right. This would bring it down past the northern tip of Indonesia, close to Banda Aceh, and sometime after that it might have chosen a southerly course, straight down into the southern Indian Ocean. 
Now, I will link to some incredible investigative work made by Captain Patrick Blelli and Jean-Luc Merchand in the description of this video, which lays out a very plausible final route. But what I really want to do now is to also look at the possibility that there actually might be more physical evidence of where this aircraft finally ended up. Even All of the more? evidence that I've presented to you so far points to a deliberate action from someone on board. Yeah, that's what everything is showing up. knowledge yeah. of the aircraft, its systems, and the airspace it was flying through. But a question that has been nagging me is that would someone who has obviously planned this so thoroughly to avoid detection bring the aircraft out to this point and then just turn the aircraft south and wait several hours until it ran out of fuel? Fair, it it feels a bit unlikely, given how active this person was during those initial parts of the maneuver, and I wouldn't be surprised if he continued to be as active until the very end. But again, this will be hard to prove without further physical evidence. Hmm. And it now looks like we might possibly have just that. Okay. That you see, back in 2008, okay. an American astrophysicist by the name of Joseph Houghton Taylor Jr. started working on something called the Weak Signal Propagation Reporter Protocol, or WHISPER Sounds so short. cool already, but okay. He had previously received the Nobel Prize in Physics back in 1993 for his work on pulsars, but he was also a keen amateur radio of enthusiast. Of course he was. <laughs> WHISPER is a protocol for low-power radio transmissions that explores how low, medium and high-frequency transmissions propagate over large distances. And Taylor designed computer software that was used to analyze these signals. Huh. When these signals move over large distances, they sometimes scatter when they hit obstacles in their path, and this causes tiny anomalies in the signal strength. Ain't no way you're trying to use some weird radio signals to effectively start pinpointing where this plane was over the Indian Ocean. Okay. This was interesting for radio amateurs because they could sometimes use those obstacles to improve overall reception. And crucially, one feature in the WHISPER protocol is that the reception from thousands of these signals have been available. uploaded oh, into a shared okay. database and stored all the way back to 2008. So there is a chance. Now, I want to be absolutely clear here and say that Taylor himself never designed Whisper to be used for the tracking of aircraft. Neither did he actually think that it was possible. Oh, okay. But Fair back enough. in 2021, an avionics system engineer called Richard Godfrey started exploring the possibility of using the Whisper database together with algorithms to look for anomalies in several different simultaneous transmissions as a kind of poor man's primary radar. Theoretically, if you know the exact location of the transmitter and the receiver, together with the time of day and about a million other factors, there might be a possibility to use tiny concurring anomalies in several of these signals to track something like an aircraft. Huh. And the really cool thing is that this technology samples thousands of signals every two minutes, which could potentially give like us much fabric. more information than we previously had. Right. Godfrey understood this, and from 2021 until today, he and his colleagues, Dr. Hannes Goetze and Professor Simon Maskell, have been trying to analyze this database to try and find traces of MH370. Damn. And in a report released on the 31st of August 2023, they claim that they have actually done just that. Hmm. Again, this video is not about whether this technology actually can be but used it's, this it's way it's a light, but okay. what I okay. find fascinating here is that it's based on verifiable stored data. So just like with DNA hmm. that couldn't be used much during the early years but has since been refined to incredible accuracy, maybe there actually is something hidden inside of these signals. Hmm. This team's trace data have actually already improved significantly from their first results as their algorithms have been evolving. And this latest report tells a quite fascinating story. Hmm. Initially, the WHISPER data coincided nicely with the existing radar information up until just prior to Vampy, where it indicated that the aircraft made a turn to a more westerly heading. It then paralleled the assumed track on a slightly more suddenly course than indicated by the raw radar, and this could be because of the inherent impreciseness of the technology, or the same from the radar, which at that point was at the very limit of its, of its effective range. Of its capability, right? yeah. In any case, the whisper track continued up towards the northwest, where it intercepted exactly the arc from the first Inmarsat handshake at time 0228 and 15 seconds. Okay. 
The data then indicates that the aircraft continued up towards a point known as Sanob, after which it made a left turn towards Urdam, all very close to what the other experts predicted that the aircraft must have done to continue avoiding military radars and additional scrutiny by ATC. Okay. Now, I won't go into all of the details of the route that the whisper data indicated, but I want to highlight a few important things. Hmm. This data pointed to a track that wasn't completely straight down into the southern Indian Ocean. Instead, it showed a series of turns, each of which was pointing towards an existing waypoint, but not ever on the same airway. This corresponds nicely with an aircraft that was still being piloted, but in a planned way to avoid interfering with existing airways huh. where a potential traffic conflict could arise. Remember, it would not be seen on TCAS, nor could Which whoever was keep... flying it mm. see other traffic. Right. If the intention was to not be detected, this type of behavior would make perfect really sense, makes sense since yeah. its ultimate destination to, would be very hard to You don't want to, to crash into a different traffic as well, fair enough. In case it was partially being monitored. The whisper data also suggested that the aircraft slowed down slightly during two different intervals of its hmm. jagged flight down towards the south, which could possibly mean step climbs. But the thing that really stood out to me was the fact that the whisper data corresponded almost perfectly with all of the seven Inmarsat handshake arcs, which is data that no one is really disputing. Hmm. Towards the end of the flight, the whisper position also indicated something very strange. Hmm. Because it looked like the aircraft started flying in a figure eight pattern in between the sixth and the seventh handshake, right. which would have been when the aircraft was predicted to be running out of fuel. Okay. The aircraft wouldn't do that by itself because the rudder compensating system in the Boeing 777 is designed to compensate for the asymmetric thrust after an engine failure. So if this pattern was actually flown, it must have been a deliberate Action. act by okay. whoever was in controls. Jesus. Now, Damn. It is very hard to speculate on why someone would do something like that. But at this time, it would have been daylight in that area and the uh, weather was yeah. clear. So it is possible that this was done to look out for ships in the area nearby as a reassurance. That is that savage. The fact that it's like it's not even about planes anymore. It's just making sure that when we go down, no one should know where we went down. Damn. That the aircraft's final resting place would not be seen. Jesus. The BFO from the Inmarsat data indicated that the aircraft could have been in a very steep descent during the last log-on handshake, as high as 14,500 feet per minute. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it just dove straight into the sea. Instead, again, according to the excellent report of Captain Jean-Luc Merchand, there is a possibility that the right engine flamed out due to fuel starvation and that this led the person in charge to start the APU and open the crossfield valve to maximize the use of the remaining fuel. Okay. The APU standpipe sits a little bit lower in the tank than the engines does, so that gives it a little bit more access to all available fuel. And the person in command could then have manually shut down the remaining engine to maximize the APU use, which would have given access to all flight controls and systems for as long as possible, and also enable the flaps to be extended, which wouldn't be possible without either one engine or the APU running. Be. When the last Inmarsat logon was completed, okay. it lacked information from, for example, the in-flight entertainment system, which is logical if the aircraft was being powered by only the APU, since systems like the IFE would then have been shed to prioritize more important systems. I don't think anyone was alive at that point. According to, to Captain Blelli's calculations, sure. the aircraft could have ended up either very close to the seventh arc if it was you in a rapid dive, dive or, or as far as 67 right. nautical miles further south if the aircraft was flown to maximize its glide and touch down with flaps 30 selected. Hmm. The whisper data showed a possible last position at time 08, 19 and 37 seconds. And after that, there were no more correlated anomalies found. We do know that the aircraft crashed in the ocean in because or near the, the already searched right area because both internal and external Flapper parts of the aircraft like have yeah. been found. The confirmed piece of debris comes from a flapper right. from the right hand yeah, wing, as well as multiple other components, which are almost certainly coming from MH370. Right, right. All of those pieces have been washed up along the coastlines of Eastern Africa and islands around by currents that can be tracked back to this general area. Hmm. And given that some of the debris found comes from inside of the aircraft, it is likely that it broke up upon impact. Damn. This horrific story have already led to improvements in tracking commercial aircraft over oceans, longer life for emergency locator transmitters, and better ATC procedures for tracking aircraft. But we can't lay this to rest before the wreckage is actually found. Damn. Again, 
This is why I created this video. Linked below here in the description are two different theories outlining two new search areas outside of those already searched in the biggest search effort in aviation history. One of those theories are based on the skill and knowledge of two veteran 777 captains to judge what is right or wrong. The only thing that I want to achieve is to get the search going again for the sake of the families left behind. So here are two relatively small new areas to search. Please get the boats out there and let's get to the bottom of this literally. That's about it. It's the end of the video. Fucking impressive. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Like, comment, subscribe. I will catch you beautiful bastards in the next one. Peace. Take care. Noise.